It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur from the CBS Television News Staff and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek Magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable George A. Dondero, United States Representative from Michigan. In this reporter's opinion, if this 83rd Congress goes down in history for nothing else, it will be known as a Congress which, which passed the St. Lawrence Seaway Bill. A bill, a measure which opens up a 2,500-mile waterway through the heart of the United States. Now, our guest tonight is the chairman of the House Public Works Committee and therefore was highly instrumental in the passage of that measure. Representative Dondero, you've been a champion of the St. Lawrence Seaway for 20 years. That's now, correct. why do you think it's a good thing for our country? Because it provides a new avenue or highway of water transportation and Water transportation in the Great Lakes area is the cheapest transportation in this world. Well, uh, do you feel it's, pu it's a purely regional measure that it will help the uh, Great Lakes cities and do harm to the other seaports in the United States, the Atlantic seaports like Philadelphia and New York? No, sir, I do not. I look upon it as a national measure of national benefit to all of our people. And I do not think that the eastern seaboard and the ports that you've named will be affected adversely to any extent that they will even notice. Mr. Don Darrow, uh, uh, this has always been so, in your opinion, I know. Uh, why was it held up so long? Where did this opposition come well, from? Well, it came from three sources. The coal industry fought it, the railroads fought it, and also the seaports along the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. What, in your opinion, was the consideration that finally put it over, got around this opposition? Two things. The determination on the part of Canada to build it alone in case we did not care to participate with her. And secondly, the discovery of what may be the largest deposit of iron ore in the world in the wilds of Labrador and Quebec. Uh, well, that brings me to this point, uh, Mr. Congressman. A lot of congressional critics say that the reason the administration has been so favorable towards the Seaway is because two of the most potent friends of President Eisenhower are members of the steel industry. And one of them is, as you know, Mr. Humphrey in the cabinet. Now, how much weight would that uh, interest of the steel industries have because we know now that uh, iron ore must come from elsewhere than the Mesabi Range in your part of the country? It had nothing to do with it, whatever. The iron ore question did because we have to admit that the iron ore deposits of the United States are diminishing rapidly because we're using 100 million tons a year and witnesses before my committee testified that by 1960, which is only six years away, we will use 150 million tons. Our ore perhaps will vanish in the next 10 to 15 years, and it had to be provided from some other source. Well, isn't it actually true that we, there's a lot of ore in, in Latin America that we can get a hold of, and that a lot of it is coming true. right into Philadelphia right now? That's true, and it comes into the port of Baltimore. But in case of war or trouble with a foreign foe, we become a very vulnerable nation when we are compelled to bring that ore across the water, just as what happened in the last war, when six out of eight ships bringing ore from Chile uh, to the United States were sunk by the German submarines in the Gulf of Mexico. Mr. Don Darrow, I was going to ask you, don't you feel that President Eisenhower's insistence that this was necessary as a, as a measure of preparation for war had something to do with overcoming the opposition ultimately? I, I think it was the major reason uh, added to the other fact uh, that uh, raw materials in greater amount are coming to the United States from Canada every year. This provides one way to bring them cheaper and in larger quantities. Well, Representative Dundero, uh, Mr. Humphrey, the present uh, Secretary of the Treasury, was once against the Seaway until in 1949 it was discovered the, that uh, these tremendous ore bodies lay up in Labrador. And it's also true that the Hanna Company, which he represents, which controls national steel, has spent about $200,000 in, in lobbying since 1949, so... You mean against the Seaway? For the Seaway when he changed his mind. No doubt the discovery of ore in Labrador and their interest. They're one of the companies that are exploring and 
and developing the ore in Labrador and Quebec. Uh, however, I don't think that entered into it very much. The steel companies of the United States are searching this world for new deposits of iron ore. Not alone the Republic Steel that's represented uh, by the Hanna people, or George Humphreys, who was interested in it, but all the steel companies of this country have been looking all over this world in Africa for new deposits of iron ore because we're using it in such increased quantities. The steel industry is expanding Mr. Don daily. Darrell, uh, the Masaba range is about worn out, is that true? Well, w the best figure we get, it'll last maybe 10 to 15 years. That's the open pit, rich iron ore. Then Labrador will become the principal source. It will c become a source added with that ore before that time, because the estimate is that we'll bring in 20 million tons of ore as soon as the uh, new canal of the St. Lawrence Seaway is open from Labrador. Representative Dundero, one of the arguments against <coughs> the Seaway has always been that uh, it's closed up for three or four months of the year when the uh, Great Lakes freeze over. Now, what are we going to do when those lakes freeze over and we have no iron ore to get across? We've answered that for 75 years in the Great Lakes area by bringing down the ore that is required for the steel industry uh, and stockpiling it in the eight months when navigation is open. We have no trouble whatever in regard to that. And the same rule that applied in bringing ore from Duluth, Minnesota, will apply to bringing it up the St. Lawrence with the same ships and using the same well, speaking machinery. Speaking of Duluth, uh, it seems to me that when uh, Herbert Hoover first proposed the Seaway a long time ago, he wanted it to run right up to Duluth. Now, uh, this isn't the same seaway, it just goes as far as, really, as Lake Erie, doesn't it? As to 27 feet. And someday in the future, maybe not for 10 years or 20 years, if they want to deepen the canals, that is the connecting channels of the Great Lakes, like the Detroit River, uh, to 27 feet, they can do it. It's 25 feet now. And on that 25 feet, we have been able to, well, we better say we've been able to do about 25% of the waterborne commerce of the entire United States. Mr. Don Darrow, uh, how much will this cost and how will it be paid for? It will cost the United States share is $105 million, and it is the only project on the North American continent uh, which will be paid for by tolls to be charged against those who use the new canals and the new locks in the St. Lawrence Seaway. And Canada's share? Canada's share is a little less than $200 million because she has four locks to build while we only have three and in addition to that, she will be compelled to lower the Welland Canal by two feet. You mean actually the people who are going to use the uh, seaway will actually pay for its cost in the long run? They will, and the period of amortization is 50 years. Well, Mr. Don Darrow, uh, 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 some people, I think, think of this as, uh, as a project designed primarily to make uh, Chicago and Duluth and the Middle Western cities great seaports, that the Queen Mary will sail into Chicago Harbor and so on. Well, what about course, that? That's not true. The Queen Mary and battleships couldn't <coughs> use the canal. It would take about 73% of the ocean ships if they want to use it. But in my judgment, the major part of the commerce of the St. Lawrence Seaway will be domestic commerce. It will not be foreign commerce, uh, such as, as iron ore, uh, wheat shipment, bulk shipment, petroleum, and petroleum products. There will be some foreign commerce, to be sure. Occasionally, well, as a matter of fact, you now see a foreign ship in the Great Lakes, do you not? Yes, sir. Uh, the little 14-foot canal that Canada built, and she had more vision than we did 55 years ago, uh, bring in little ships 250 feet long of about 2,500 tons capacity. Well, Representative Dundero, uh, what ports do you expect on the Great Lakes will benefit most from the sea? There are 16 major ports on the Great Lakes, such as Toledo, Cleveland, Ashtabula, Lorraine, Detroit, and then going up around uh, Saginaw, Bay City, Chicago, uh, Milwaukee on the Wisconsin coast, Duluth, Minnesota, and so on, Superior, Wisconsin. Of course, they won't all benefit equally. Which do you, what do you expect will be the great uh, St. Lawrence port in the future then? I don't think you can say that any one port will be the great St. Lawrence port. All of the ports uh, that wish to can use the St. Lawrence Seaway commerce. Now, do you think that the uh, actual passing of the measure under the Eisenhower administration will have a pervasive effect on the uh, coming congressional elections in your part of the world? I doubt it very much. Uh, Perhaps those who uh, were for it might gain uh, something by it, and uh, I can say to you that it's not a partisan measure in the least. It's bipartisan. Both parties supported it. Uh, both in the Middle West, the Republican and Democratic congressmen all supported it. 
Reverend Zondero, you are very optimistic, and you may well be because you have a right to be about the St. Lawrence Seaway. But uh, what about the coming congressional elections? Do you feel quite as optimistic about those as well, a Republican? That's a political question, and um, perhaps there are many people in the country who are disappointed. Nevertheless, the Eisenhower administration has accomplished some real things, and this St. Lawrence Seaway that we're discussing, in my judgment, is one of the major accomplishments oh. of the president's administration. Representative, when will it be ready? When will we be able to go It'll down take the five years. to go to Duluth? It'll take five years to build it. At the end of that time, I hope, and I said so to the president, that he and I could take a trip on the first ship through it. And who's going to build it? To be will built it be private industry the or the Army or? The Corps of Army Engineers of the United States and the Canadian Corps of Engineers <laughs> will have supervision and control of it. Some of the work will be let out to private contractors. Uh, the Army engineers in the United States do that all over our country. Now, will we be able to get any hydroelectric power out of it, or th will this hurt the potential of the St. Lawrence no. of hydroelectric? No, the power and the navigation must be built together because uh, the dams that will furnish the hydroelectric power are also the dams that furnish the water for the canals for navigation. Well, thank you very much, Representative Dondero, for some very informative the opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speaker. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable George A. Dondero, United States Representative from Michigan. They say that everyone sees the watch on your wrist. To be really well dressed, every detail must conform, including your watch. Now, Longines makes a watch to fill every need to suit every taste. The choice of models and styles is almost unlimited. For ladies, Longines creates superb examples of the jeweler's art, exquisite in taste and finish, and literally for every occasion. For men, Longines produces watches for every requirement, watches for dress and sport. Longines automatic watches, the most advanced in the world. Waterproof and shock-resistant watches for rugged service. Longines chronograph watches for sportsmen and for scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique standards of excellence which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And this statement is true throughout the world. The Longines watch on your wrist is not only one of the finest watches made anywhere in the world, but equally important, it's the watch of highest prestige. And yet, unbelievably, you may own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.